So let us proceed. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming back. Um, Christina Schaefer is going to introduce um, our next panel of speakers. Yeah. So welcome back. Um, up next, we have the first of two Innovation for the Customer panels, which will examine how consumer products and services are enhancing the customer electricity experience through the application of innovation and technology at various customer touch points. Um, our panelists include Richard Caperton from Oracle Utilities, E.E. E. Zhang from Nest Energy Partnerships, and Katie Gary um, from Enernoc. And so Richard's going to get us started. Christina, I think it's also very important to note that E.E. E. is a Columbus, Ohio native. So just, okay. So 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 scored points already, E.E. E. Well thank done. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me back. All right. Uh, good to see you all. Thank you for having me again. Richard Caperton with Oracle Utilities. I want to talk about three things today. First, I wanted to build off of Paul's presentation from this morning and talk about the intersection of customer expectations and customer satisfaction with grid modernization. Then I'm going to show a customer experience and what customers could be seeing as a result of grid modernization and improve some new programs and services. And then finally, I want to say just a little bit about the investments that utilities are going to have to make to deliver these new services and maybe some regulatory implications of those investments. Um, please interrupt throughout if you have any questions. I'm happy to, happy to pause if you would like, but I'll, uh, I'll work through the things. So let's start talking about what customers look for from technology. And here we see two cameras, a uh, Nikon and a Canon, both of which are excellent machines and which competed long and hard for market share in the camera market around the world. And of course, there is a dominant player in the camera market today, but it's neither of them. It's a smartphone. And that's not because a smartphone made a better camera. In fact, it's by all accounts a worse camera uh, from a technical perspective. But it's better because it meets the customer expectations. Customers like to use it because it's accessible to them and it's convenient. And cameras aren't the only industry that's undergone this sort of revolution. Think about smartphones. Think about video rentals. Think about um, taxi cabs switching to Uber. All of these things have changed because customers enjoy the new experience. They like the accessibility and the convenience of the new experience, and it's meeting their needs better. So what does that have to do with utilities? Well, utilities, for a long time in this industry, we have thought of utility problems as engineering problems that required engineering solutions. And that led to things like, let's just build new systems, new technologies. And those technologies have certainly worked, and that's been a very, those have largely been good investments, but part of it is missing, and it's what do the customers want. And we aren't necessarily delivering exactly what customers want and meeting customer expectations. And that's a missed opportunity. And as you uh, go about grid modernization, you can fix that problem. Now, Historically, just think back 10, 15 years to the early days of smart grid, and you were at this technology trigger stage on the far left, the invention of the smart meter, for example, something like that. And then around uh, the stimulus bill, you saw a lot of investment in smart grid, first wave of deployment of smart grid, and that was something like what we see here, this peak of inflated expectations. Everybody was going to benefit, customers were going to love it, and it turns out that those investments didn't really deliver a whole lot of what customers were looking for. Customers didn't see, with their own eyes, a lot of benefits from that first wave of deployment. And that led to the smart grid falling into what we call this trough of disillusionment, where customers weren't seeing the benefits. And, it, and the smart grid deployment, the first wave, ended partly because the customers didn't see the benefit, but also partly because the government money disappeared, the federal government support. Now, though, we're seeing the second wave of smart grid deployment, just like we're seeing here in Ohio, and we're getting to the slope of enlightenment where we're meeting customer needs, and that's going to get us along a much better path, a much more sustainable path for smart grid deployment. Now, this is important because not, this isn't just about the smart grid, but utilities in general have struggled to break out of this trough of disillusionment recently because there's a whole lot more that utilities could be doing to keep up with other service providers, but they're not. And that results in this information. This is from a, a survey, a J.D. Power survey of different industries. We've got 17 different industries here. And you see that electric and gas utilities are the worst two rated industries out of all of them, behind things such notable customer gems as rental cars, airports, cable companies, 
you know, when electric and gas utilities are falling behind them, that's a problem. And everybody here should be concerned about that. And we're certainly concerned about that. And we need to, we need to break out of this and improve this experience. So both customers and utilities know uh, what could be done better. And let me just say a little bit about that. Let's start with utilities. Like what could utilities do to solve this problem? So you talk with utility executives. This is a survey of about 100 IT executives at utilities and leadership. And this is showing what they know they need to do to improve the customer engagement, the, what capabilities they need, what's important, and what they don't actually have today. And it's showing the biggest gap in the two, what they need and what they don't have. And the first is a 360 degree view of the customer. So uh, historically utilities know customer name, account number, service address, historical usage, and that's about it. What if they also knew, does that customer have an electric vehicle? When does that customer use energy? What is some demographic information about that customer? If they had that, they would be much better uh, able to target customers with good programs. Now the next thing here is proactive alerts and notifications. Think about your uh, cell phone company, where you get a text if you're about to use all your data. Think about your bank, where you get a text or an email if you're about to overdraw your checking account. Utilities don't deliver those experiences today, but they certainly could, and customers expect those experiences from their service providers. And finally, the third huge gap we saw is in this, what we call here, contact center next best action. When a customer calls the call center, the call center rep typically knows just what the utility basic information is. Name, account, service address, have they called the call center before and what their historic usage looks like. That is insufficient for meeting customer needs today. What they could do is recommend an action for a customer to take. And if they had that ability, then the customer would be much better served. They'd be much happier with that call and they would be less likely to call again because you would have actually solved a problem for them. So that's the, what the utilities are focused on. And then think about this from the customer side, the experiences they're getting from other service providers and what utilities could be doing better. And what we really see is that customers only want to hear from their utilities at certain times when it matters and when that information is going to be useful for them. So we actually started a project about two years ago thinking about what are those moments, what are those experiences that you need to provide. And I you know, thought that we would be able to come up naively with like 50 of these. But you run out of ideas pretty quickly and you end up with about a dozen moments that matter. This is the only time that customers really want to hear from their utilities. It's when they sign up for new service. It's when there's an outage. It's when there's a rate change, things like that. And if you can improve these experiences, then you can improve the entire utility experience. So a relatively finite number of times that, that you have to engage with the customer. Let me pause there. Any, any everything sounding good to folks? Absolutely. And so, okay. Richard, yes. I don't want to overrule your rules. Yeah, I appreciate that greatly. Thank you. Thank you. That's a rarity around here. So <laughs> Forget what I said. Uh, please don't ask any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just continue. So, um, so what would this actually look like for a customer? If you were uh, meeting those cust the utility needs, uh, providing the capabilities utilities want to provide, and engaging customers at the moments that matter. Let's look about what that means for a customer. We've given her a name here, Geneva, but she is a relatively, uh, she's a fixed income customer. She's not super engaged with the utility today. Minimal, but some amount of online uh, experience with the utility. And importantly, she's one of these customers that's heard of smart meters but isn't super excited and mostly is just worried they're going to cost money and add to her bill. How can we improve this experience? What can we do through grid modernization to make Geneva happy? So you start with the first experience being a positive one. Actually give her information before a smart meter is deployed at the start of the grid modernization process that lets her know what's going to happen going forward. Get out in front of any concerns she has and just tell her, like, this is going to help you understand how you use energy. This is going to solve problems for you. After she sees that, oops, sorry. Is it showing up on your screen, Christina? So that was my fault. Um, so then a few weeks later, 
she can get an email. This is a customer where the utility has her email address that tells her now you have a smart meter that's out there and it gives her some smart, smart meter enabled data, hourly usage data. So she sees immediate benefits and she sees like, this is interesting. I didn't know when I was using information and now she knows something that she didn't know before. So some benefit. Now building on that, this could also be a customer that gets home energy reports, just like many Ohio utility customers get home energy reports that tell them how their usage compares to their neighbors and how they can use less, uh, less energy. Only in this case, it's paired with smart meter data. So we give her a targeted experience about when, um, give her, her advice about the afternoon being when she, when she uses the most energy. So a very targeted experience. Now, you can build from there. She can follow a, a link on that, uh, you could email her that home energy report or she could type it in, uh, but she goes to online, just like she does, and uh, she would see increased energy usage information. See things like bill comparisons, bill projections, and online energy audit. So she gets very easy to use experiences that actually help her manage her energy use and put her in control of her energy use. Unfortunately, that's not gonna solve all of her problems. And a few months later, she could end up getting a high bill. But in this case, when she calls the call center, the utility has figured out how to deliver a next best action recommendation. So they give her information on why she had a high bill this time, but importantly, they also sign her up for something called a high bill alert that would let her know when she's on track for a high bill and how to avoid it next time. So then a few months later, in the early summertime, she would get a high bill alert. And this lets her know, this month, you might get a bill for more than $200. That's more than you usually pay. And here's some things that you could do to avoid that. So she takes some action and avoids a high bill that month, which is just a great experience. You know, and that, that's the sort of thing that's gonna get people excited about the smart grid and smart meters and grid modernization. Now you can, sorry, you can keep going and see maybe later in the summer there's a heat wave. And in this case, she has automatically been signed up for a peak alert notification that lets her know uh, the grid is gonna be under stress because it's an especially hot day. And here are some things that she can do to help. Maybe even save money if you have a special rate for that. But you know, let her know it's a peak day and she can save energy. And so she takes some action. And then finally, at the end of that month, at the end of the summer, this customer has saved money She's more engaged with her energy use, and she's taken control of her energy use. And importantly, she's linking all of that back to the smart meter that she got at the beginning of the year. So a much more comprehensive experience for grid modernization that is going to delight this customer. Now let me just say a little bit about the investments that utilities have to make to deliver these services. Um, these services are not going to be delivered just through hardware. They're going to involve software too. Now, utilities historically have built a lot of their own software. They're clearly moving beyond that, just like any other industry. Utilities aren't software developers. They're power providers. They're customer engagement specialists. They need to work with external software providers, and they're starting to do that. But importantly, the type of software they buy is also changing. So not just do they buy it or do they build it, but also what are they buying now that they're buying? Now, historically, software has been bought on a disk and it would come to the utility and it would sit on a server at the utility. That model is disappearing in virtually every other industry and it's moving to the cloud or software as a service where the software lives on a server that's remote and is accessed via the internet. There are many benefits to that, uh, cost effectiveness, security, performance of the software, all sorts of reasons why other industries are moving that direction. Now, maybe not everything is gonna move that direction. You could imagine some things wanna stay on premise. Uh, that's up for the utility to make a decision about the best way to deliver their software solutions. But there's an important regulatory component here that historically, um, those on-premise solutions where the software is housed at the utility has been part of the rate base. And the software as a service, the cloud-based solution has been viewed as an operating expense. That clearly biases utilities in favor of the historic solution. And it's important as you think about grid modernization to also think about updating these regulations and updating the treatment of cloud-based software and on-prem software so that they're on a level footing. 
This issue has gotten some attention across the country. Uh, there's a proceeding in Illinois that you're probably aware of. Uh, New York has already addressed this issue in an order. There was a resolution at the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners last fall. So there, there, is a, there are a number of precedents on how to solve this issue, and we'd be happy to talk with you more about that. So uh, we look forward to working with you over the next months and figuring out, uh, answering any questions you have, uh, but also figuring out how we can meet customer needs and customer expectations and help utilities keep up with the other, the other um, industries that utilities get services from. Thank you for your time. And I can, do you want to do questions now or we'll after wait, everything? We'll wait till all the presentations okay, thank you, thank you. shorter here <laughs> thank you for having me and thanks for the homecoming chairman and commissioners <laughs> all right again I'm E.E. E. Zhang and I lead energy partnerships for Nest uh, primarily in the Midwest region so taking really best practices and learnings across this region and, and seeing how we can replicate them uh, throughout the region and also nationwide Let's see if I can actually use this all right so how do we think at Nest about the customer? I think that's what we're all here today to talk about. Um, and, and even more so than just how we think about the customer, number two is you know, how do we extend that to energy products and services? And primarily through the Nest Learning Thermostat, um, how do we get Nest, Nest thermostats or smart thermostats in more homes? How do we then, after they're in homes, how can we leverage those thermostats to do even more for energy efficiency and demand response, time varying rates, customer engagement? Um, and so I, I do want to finish the presentation with how we're working with utilities right now across the nation on these programs. But first, uh, you know, thinking about the perception of the smart home. I think we've been talking about the smart home now for really decades. You know, in 1939, popular mechanics was talking about the electric home of the future. And, and you know, fast forward about six decades, there's this uh, movie called Dream Home. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but there is this computer named Helen that takes over the house and holds the occupants hostage. You know, Disney came out with something a little bit more friendly called the smart home, a little less scary. And I think there's this perception in, in you know, for, for really decades now that it's either really complicated or really futuristic, it's really techy, or it's very, you know, nefarious or, you know, scary, big brother. And, you know, I think that's where really Nest steps in here. We make beautiful products that are simple to use. We don't think that the smart home is necessarily about a whole change out of a home. So I don't think, you know, you'll wake up one April afternoon and say, oh, I want a smart home. I'm going to change out my home and make it a smart home. Customers buy products. They, they think about their lights or their thermostat or their fridge and they change them out one at a time. And, and so Nest is really creating a home with those products that takes care of the people inside it and the world around it. And that's been our mission from the beginning and continues to be our mission. And so how does Nest think really about the customer? With our products, we are looking at, you know, simplicity. Is it simple to use? Is it easy to understand? Um, is it absolutely necessary? And everything else falls away. Next, you know, is it human? We really think that we should be friendly and forthright. We are having a conversation with the customer. We're not talking about you know kilowatts and kilowatt hours. We're we're talking about saving money, saving energy, and then customers really like to be delighted. I mean, we're talking about thermostats, and thermostats is not something that people typically think about. And so it's it's been something really exciting for us that we've been able to delight customers to change out a, a perfectly you know working thermostat to 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 buy a buy a new thermostat and install it themselves and and really um, be delighted. And finally, you know, user experience is absolutely critical. We really start from their first user experience. Um, this is a, a picture of a screw, so it's included in the box, including it, with it included is, is two universal screws. So right out of the box, you know, customers can install everything themselves without needing to go find their toolkit or whatnot. So user experience is always at the heart of this. So how can we extend these principles, simplicity, human, 
delight, user-friendly? How can we extend those to energy products? I think, you know, we work a lot with utilities. Utilities are looking for solutions to, you know, stabilize the grid. They're thinking about, you know, rate design, time varying rates, for example. And they're also thinking about engaging customers. And unfortunately, a lot of times energy programs can be really complex and really confusing to customers. They're talking about demand response, you know, there's behavioral demand response, there's peak time rebates, there's load control switches, you know, there's a lot of things that customers don't really understand. What they hear is, you know, what is a kilowatt? What is a kilowatt hour? Aren't I already on a time of use rate? So, you know, I think we, we go back to that principle of customers are really buying these products. They're buying smart thermostats because they want to be comfortable, they want to be, you know, they want it to be convenient and they want to save money. And so as we're thinking through, you know, customer focused energy programs, we really want to keep those principles in mind. We want to keep simplicity in mind. We want to keep, uh, we want to make sure we're having a conversation that they know what they're talking, they, they know what these programs are about, but that the, the end result is still really simple. It's not about kilowatts or kilowatt hours. It's, you know, they're saving money, they're helping the environment, um, they're helping their, their uh, wallets. And so as, as we're looking into, you know, how these apply to uh, utilities, we look at energy efficiency first. So, you know, there are three tiers of programmable, or actually thermostats in general. You've heard a lot of different terminology. There's programmable, there's communicating or Wi-Fi, and then there's the smart or advanced. And I think we occupy uh, a very small category of the smart and advanced, those with occupancy sensors with that, that you know, automatically adjust. You know, you, for, the, for the Nest, it programs itself. You turn it up or down, and it learns the temperatures you like and creates a custom schedule for your home. And so when you're not home, it automatically turns it down so you're not wasting energy while you're not home. And I think that's, that's really the principle of, of these smart or advanced thermostats that is a little different from communicating or programmable thermostats that are proven you know, not, not necessarily to work because that, there's that really convenient hold button that, that customers like to push. And, and thankfully, you know, in independent studies, we've seen 10 to 12 percent savings on heating, 15 percent savings on cooling. And so these really save and they, they really pay for themselves. And going back to really customer, customer first. So it's an extremely easy setup. Most customers install it themselves, 90 percent do. Um, and they're compatible with most homes. And so we still see, even after six years, 90% of customers are installed it themselves. And I think that's tremendous. You know, you, you can see on YouTube, there's you know, a seven-year-old girl who, who can install one. So if you can't, you know. <laughs> no, but we, we, we also know that there's some people who don't want to even touch, you know, these wires. And so uh, we work with utilities and, and contractors alike. We're actually going to film a video after this that's entitled, How Many Commissioners Does It Take to Install <laughs> NS Thermostat? I love it. Answer are probably all fine. <laughs> Talk about customer ed education there. I think you guys could do a great job with it. <laughs> yeah. And we are also recently uh, Energy Star certified. And you know, there's that wonderful green leaf as well from a visual standpoint. So customers can actually see when they're at a more efficient set point. That visual cue is really, really important. It's real-time feedback for customers. And so you know, this is know, entirely inherent to, you know, how we think about um, the, the product itself. And why most people probably buy a smart thermostat is because you can control it from your phone. We don't require um, Wi-Fi. All the energy efficiency features are still embedded in the device. But if you do connect it to Wi-Fi, you are able to control it remotely. And talking about, and I think Richard uh, touched touch upon this, was, you know, data. You know, I think we're, we're always thinking about, oh, more data is good data, and customers need to just keep seeing everything that they, they want to see. But I think, you know, from our perspective, it's, you know, insights. What can we show, and can we say, you know, why this is happening, and, and can we potentially make recommendations for, you know, for doing things differently? I think a great example of um, energy efficiency and, and utility programs is, is this uh, Illinois initiative 
It's a one million, million thermostat initiative. It's actually a one million smart thermostat initiative. So by 2020, ComEd and the gas utilities in Illinois want to get a million smart thermostats on households um, in northern Illinois, or actually all of Illinois. And the reason why they did this was uh, in 2013, there was a wasted energy study that identified the cooling was the greatest opportunity to reduce behavioral waste. And so increasing temperature offsets or set points was a really great way to do that. And smart thermostats was the most recognizable ne next step after really lighting for energy efficiency. And how ComEd, for example, is approaching this, they're thinking about not only energy efficiency, but also changing customer perceptions of the utility, the way you know customers control their energy usage and how they really engage with them. So, you know, how are you going to get to the million? I think there's been a lot of questions about, you know, customer engagement, education. I think there's three key key points here. You know, you, you keep it really simple again. You keep the message really simple for the customer. You try to reduce friction and any barriers to entry. You know, rebates have been really, really helpful. And, and Comet has put a $100 rebate, and the gas utilities have another $50 added in. And, and you also meet customers where they are. So whether it's at retail, whether it's through a utility program, whether it's through uh, contractors, you, you really bring, bring these products to them wherever they are. And it's not just ComEd, you know, it's actually across the country. You're seeing these programs pop up and it's really been over the, the last couple of years and it's been really exciting to see because you know penetration is still really low among these this technology we hear about it all the time because we're in the sector but across the country you know we're just getting into that early mass segment you know i, I think that more more not only customer awareness from a utility perspective but also technology providers you know, we're, we're all teaming together to to make sure that we we can get as many of these devices in in homes as as we can and it's all also not limited to you know just people purchasing it out. Uh, you know, for example, Energy, uh, Entergy, and, and Tucson are um, putting these in as measures into their existing low-income programs. And so we think that there's incredible potential with low-income programs, low and moderate-income pro programs, and multifamily programs as well. So really applicable across all sectors. So after you have these devices on the wall, what next? Right, you're thinking. All right, we have these devices. What can we do with them? That's exactly, you know, I think the exciting part of what we can do with these connected home products. So think about um, what if we can overnight enroll these programs in oh, in a energy efficiency program through a utility pro a partner. So traditional energy programs are usually really disconnected. They require truck roll. People are, you know, going out to the homes. But these, now that you have smart thermostats, they're already connected by Wi-Fi, and you can actually deploy software services through these th through these devices for incremental energy benefits. So something, for example, that Nest offers is seasonal savings, uh, which is twice a year every year before you're using the majority of your heating or cooling. Uh, we, uh, you know, nudge those temperatures ever so slightly uh, to be at a, a, a more energy efficient baseline temperature. And that way, customers can save you know, even greater over the course of a few weeks. And the, the comfort is unchanged because it's going to be less than a, a degree of, of temperature setback. But um, overall, they're going to drive three to five percent savings. So it's really exciting that you know overnight you can really enroll you know a, a big majority into these these energy efficiency programs. And I think how are we doing on time? We're okay. Uh, so rush hour awards I think is a, is a really exciting thing. On top of energy efficiency, we also have demand response programs. And how we're approaching demand response I think is extremely different from a lot of traditional legacy switches, for example. So rush hour awards, even even that name. So what's in a name? You know, traditional programs are they're talking about peak demand or you know demand response. I demand, you respond. Doesn't sound that friendly. <laughs> So think about rush hour awards. It's, it's something that people understand. Rush hour on the, on the streets, people know, you know, there's certain times in the day that it's, there's traffic on, on the roads. So you apply that to the grid. There's certain times in the day that there is rush hours on the grid. And why don't we have the smart thermostat be your GPS guide that guides you around 
and detours around those types of congestion and something that's really automated that's, again, simple from a customer perspective that they don't have to do anything, that they can just enroll in a program and it's it's incredibly customer friendly and really easy to use. So so you're going to get much more mass adoption for for a program like this, and understanding that there's only a little limited time here. Um, what have we learned from these programs? We've been running these programs for about four years with utility partners across the country. Customers love it. Eighty percent of Rush Hour Award customers love demand response program. Let's, let's pause there. 80% love demand response and would recommend it to their friends and family. No, really, they're tweeting about it. <laughs> it's, it's really, I think it's something where you're, you're actually engaging with the customer. They understand what it means. You're ke still keeping it simple because they don't have to act. They don't have to change anything. The thermostat is going to do that automatically for them. And from their perspective, they, they don't have any issues with, with comfort. And so they're going to keep doing it and they keep participating. And the utilities are going to be able to get much more mass participation. So I think that's what we're looking at when we're thinking about really customer friendly, customer focused, um, you know, easy, simple programs. And another example is uh, Southern Cal Edison down in Southern California <laughs> has about 50 million customers. They um, have been partnering with us since 2013 for uh, Rush Hour Award program. They have the largest program right now uh, with 20,000 customers. Um, and recently they actually encourage, uh, they, they have a partnership with SoCal Gas down there as well to increase the incentive to enroll customers into Rush Hour Awards to also address uh, the recent Aliso Ca Canyon gas leap. And so with $125 incentive, customers are enrolling in this program and we're continuing to partner with them to market and drive more participation. So you're, you're really looking at scale now. You're not thinking about you know, these as little pilots here and there. You're, you're thinking about these programs at scale. And what if we could manage even more complexity for the customer? So think about time of use rates. They really make sense for the grid, but they don't really make a lot of sense for customers. But you know, with technology, you can really make it easy for the customer. And so the technology can manage the rate so that com uh, customers don't have to. I think this is this is where we're really getting to kind of the next level is is beyond energy efficiency, beyond demand response. What can we do with with rate design and and time varying rates? And I think that's exactly what we're thinking with with um, utility partners now. We're we're working actively with with quite a few of them to figure out what makes the most sense, but while while keeping it really really simple for the customer. And so you know keep customers informed, remind them if. They, there is a, a peak period that the, the thermostat will make an adjustment, let them know when the seasons and the rates change. So really transparent, really simple, really easy for them to see what's happening, but not actually requiring them to, to take any action. So really making it very automated. And so, you know, finally, great programs really like those great products out there. We really need to keep it simple for customers. And I'll end with a really lovely, you know, I think Patty was actually talking about this as the gateway to engage customers, and we really feel that way. Smart thermosets are truly the, the, the gateway into the home and to engage customers on energy and, and uh, build upon that foundation with additional energy efficiency, demand response, time of use programs. And you know, I think as we're moving forward, we're going to see a, a, a very vibrant ecosystem of connected home products because, again, customers buy products. They don't buy a whole home. And I think I want to end with a video if we have time. So you know, I've babbled on about thermostats. And you're thinking, really? Do people really care about thermostats? And so this was a recent, actually last July, we uh, ran a promotion in Chicago through um, a vending machine. So here you go.
a thermostat. That's pretty incredible. And I will say, I just want to shout out to the the utilities in, in Ohio. I think there's been some some new rebates to to really um, drive adoption. I think we're really excited about it. So AP Ohio has a seventy five dollar rebate. Columbia Gas has another seventy five. Um, Dayton and Vectron all have seventy five dollar rebates. So we're excited about the this this is really the beginning, and and we're excited about really building upon that. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Don't, don't press one on the bottom right. Uh, right. There we go. Okay. There we go for the short one. Um, first, before I get into my presentation, I'm going to start out by saying that. I am Geneva from Richard's uh, presentation. <laughs> I often say that I was born about 30 years too late. Um, I'm also quite frightened of the Terminator movies. I don't understand why people don't learn from things like that. So that might sound a little odd that that is me as a person and I'm speaking on the innovation and technology panel. <laughs> um, but I, I say that because um, I think it's important to understand the baseline that I bring as an individual, um, as a person, um, to, and what the perspective that I bring to what my company does and how important it is to focus on customers. Uh, what I have here are just a few quotes as I was doing some research and trying to understand what Power Forward is all about. I went through and I found some quotes, just some general information, some from Chairman Hawk himself. Um, and it, it, I think that they were quite telling to me. As a leading global demand response provider, we have experience in many different types of markets, both wholesale and retail, good and bad. Um, and we've seen lots of different initiatives, big and small, for reform, both succeed and fail, which is why there were two things in a lot of the materials that I read about Power Forward that really uh, jumped out at me, um, particularly when we had the organizational call with Chairman Hawk uh, last week about his objectives for this panel, and specifically a technology review just for the sake of the technology review, that won't get us to where we need to be and enhancing the consumer electric experience. Um, we can talk about a lot of technology. We can talk about high level principles. We can talk about economics. I'm friends with Joe Bowering. But if you don't talk about what's actually going on in Geneva's apartment or in the pizza shop down the street, then it doesn't matter what you've done in terms of innovative technologies. You have to really connect with the customer. And so again, why am I the person who's afraid of Terminator movies um, here as an appropriate person to speak on this panel? And it's because I am thrilled to be able to talk to you all about what I see as the greatest success story in innovation and technology in the energy space on the demand side, which is demand response. And that focusing on um, demand response, there are three high-level topics that I wanted to cover here today. Uh, the first is demand response as we know it. Um, again, we are in a lot of different markets around the world, so we see a lot of different flavors of demand response. I'm going to break it down um, in terms of what is relevant specifically to Ohio at this point in time, particularly given some different uh, trends and issues going on out in the market um, and what's particularly re relevant for your consumers and for your EDCs. Um, I'm also going to talk about what are the re recipes for success and happy customers? What have we learned um, as being a leading demand response provider um, both in Ohio and around the world over the past several years? Um, how, did, uh, how did demand response become the greatest success in innovation and technology on the demand side. How did that happen and what have we learned for that? And then finally, I'll bring it all back together in terms of a roadmap for the future. How do we build on the lessons that we've learned? Um, what are some important things that I would like to leave you with at the end of the day as you think about the next stage of, of power forward? Um, so we'll be looking at all three of these things, um, specifically focusing on how to modernize the grid with innovative technology, all all while ensuring we are collectively enhancing customers' electricity consumption experience. So this is just the slide, um, why should you care what I have to say? Most of you know who Enernoc is and what we've done. These are just some 
high-level points um, relevant to your mission here through Power Forward um, and why it's relevant to our perspective, how we have invested over $200 million to date in technology, um, the amount of savings that we have been able to achieve on behalf of our customers. Happy to del delve into more details of who Enernoc is and how we've evolved over the years, but I want to focus more on, on the high-level topics, but happy to answer any questions on that. So what is DR? Because we use demand response as a very high level generic term, but there are a lot of different flavors of demand response out there. Um, this is a slide um, that we have used many different times before. Some of you may have even seen this slide in the past. Um, it gives you a lot of perspective um, on the different types, where they can come from, who can be providing them, the different types of benefits of demand response. But as I said, I'm Geneva, um, and I need things simplified um, for me. And I think it's helpful to simplify it, particularly when you're looking at it for a customer perspective. And so for the purposes, as I see it in Ohio, um, there are three different types of demand response that I think that you really should be focusing on. The first is operationally dispatchable demand response. For better or for worse, that is PJM demand response today. That is a a dispatch of a demand resource in response to a specific system need. A dispatch signal, um, either emergency or pre-emergency with PJM's system, um, energy, ancillary services, whatever the trigger is for the operational need for that resource, that's what that type of DR is. But then there's a second flavor, um, general bucket of demand response, and that's peak shaving or peak load management. Now that can be done on an individual customer basis, where they are individually, through insights such as some of the technology that my co-panelists have discussed, they see the times when they can peak shave um, and manage it down themselves. But there are also institutionalized utility programs, and I will uh, specifically reference the Pennsylvania Act 129 program. That is a peak shaving program. It is a state program implemented by the utilities that is complementary to and layered on top of the PJM operational demand response program. So those are two different flavors of DR, but they can be accomplished with the same customers. There is an additional flavor of demand response. Again, these are high-level categories for simple Geneva. Um, but the avoidance or deferral of distribution system investments. I'll call your attention to specifically New York. There is a Con Ed program where they were able to defer investments. I believe it was in a very expensive substation. Um, you, you, the, our infrastructure needs to be invested in, no doubt. Um, but there are investments that need to be made right now and some investments that can be deferred as we take more cost-effective solutions. And that's what the demand response program in New York um, specifically attributed towards deferring distribution uh, investment needs has been centered around. And again, the key is that it is layered on top of other programs. So there are a couple of keys for success um, for all different flavors of DR that I've just walked through. Um, the first is, again, what I've mentioned, the layering of programs. You have customers who have a baseline of operationally dispatchable demand response reduction capabilities that say PJM can dispatch year round. But then they have an additional amount of, um, of reduction capability that is driven by their heat sensitive weather, weather heat sensitive load um, in the summer. And, and so if you look at the Act 129 program as an example, that is a way to capture the operationally dispatchable demand reductions that customers have at their facilities and allows them to be paid for that. You then can also separately capture that summer peaking reduction capability that is only there in the summer months and which is, by the way, not on its own able to qualify in the PJM program anymore. Uh, an, an additional, uh, so the key is layering on those programs. An additional uh, element of success in all three of these types of programs is the ability to aggregate, specifically um, in Ohio, the permission of curtailment service providers to be able to aggregate customers, whether it is um, operationally dispatch dispatchable demand response, peak shaving or peak load management, or even in the uh, deferral of in infrastructure investment type DR programs. 
So the flavors of DR, perhaps the one that is most important to all of you, is the Ohio flavor of demand response. So I just wanted to give a little bit of insight in terms of our personal experience with demand response in Ohio. This is back to the 15-16 delivery year. I'm slightly sensitive to the information that's on here. So this is a delivery year that has already concluded. Um, what are some key takeaways for you to understand in terms of what you see here, which is a very successful demand response footprint <coughs> in Ohio? The first is this is all P PJM. All of this demand response that we as NRNOC were able to bring to market were the operationally dispatchable kind. So, so that's where you see that coming from. Um, you see different sizes of customers. The operationally dispatchable DR is not just for large commercial and industrial customers. It is for all different types of customers, small and large. There are also different types of industries that they, they are in. They are a wide range. Um, this has created both millions in direct payments for Ohio consumers as well as millions in societal benefits for savings for even the customers who are not participating in the demand response. Additional benefits are that money that has been obtained from participants, these are all, this is all megawatts that customers were paid to reduce on command. Those are dollars, and I'm gonna get into some key studies, those are dollars that have been reinvested in energy efficiency projects. They've been reinvested in the facilities themselves. They've allowed customers to become more efficient, and they've allowed customers to become more reliable and more resilient. If that is not an enhanced customer experience, I'm not sure what else there is. We have, and again, I'm gonna get into some, some case studies. Understand that competition as a supply resource, as a wholesale supply resource, is just as important to us. The strength of the price signals that come from the capacity market are just as important to us as a wholesale provider of capacity in the PJM market as they are, say, to an incumbent supplier of generation. Um, and that is because, as I've alluded to and as I'm gonna get into more, the payment is key to customers. There are price points at which some customers will not participate in an operationally dispatchable program. And so while they might vary in terms of the range as to where those prices are, the price point in being paid for your service to be available as a capacity resource is just as important to customers who are signing up and putting themselves on the hook for penalties it is, as it is for generators that would like to keep their baseload generators around. That it, we have the utmost faith in wholesale markets and believe in the strength of capacity market price signals. I just wanted to make sure that I reinstilled that, that, that importance to us. Um, but that again is all centered around wholesale DR. So getting back into demand response at a high level, one of the things that I highlighted before is what has been key to providing an enhanced customer experience, ensuring the maximum benefit for demand response on behalf of consumers, and that's the concept of aggregation. I like this slide. We've used it a number of different times to, to convey a number of different principles. Um, what I like about this slide is, first of all, that it shows that all different kinds of customers are suitable for participating in demand response. They're all very different, and they can all be very close, or they all can be very different from each other other. It is the innovation, technology, skills, and expertise of CSPs that aggregate those resources that make them most cost efficient and most reliable. Um, something that Richard had pointed out earlier in terms of the 360 degree view of all different kinds of customers, we as a CSP, we as an aggregator, we don't do our job as an aggregator if we don't have that 360 degree view of every single one of our customers, whether they are the healthcare provider, whether they are the education institution, or whether they're the grocery store down the street. Um, yes, there are customers that can and do participate in demand response on their own, but the greatest efficiencies can be achieved when we are aggregating them together. Don't just take my word for it, though, in terms of the value that aggregation and CSPs bring to the table. If you look specifically at the PJM market, in the 17-18 delivery year, and I pulled this from um, the PJM most recent load management activity report, 85% 
of the operationally dispatchable DR that, that is out there. 85% of the DR that is in PJM comes from CSPs. So our value um, and passing along the value, not just economically to our consumers, it has, has demonstrated itself in terms of our presence in the market. So again, I talked about case studies. Let's get into a couple of those uh, case studies that we have here to talk about why has demand response been so successful? Why has it yielded the benefits? Why does it continue to yield the benefits? Why did it prompt a knockdown, drag out fight at the Supreme Court not that long ago to preserve demand response? No matter what parties were in that case, Everybody, it was interesting that everybody acknowledged the value. That was about jurisdiction, but everybody acknowledged the value of demand response. So why does everybody have such a stake in demand response? Let's get into some real customer examples, <coughs> excuse me, um, in terms of where is the innovation and technology enhancing customers' experience with demand response. Um, on this slide, I've provided you with the source uh, link. These are publicly available case studies. We have a ton of them available on our website, again, that are publicly available. I pulled out a few here that I thought were particularly on point demonstrating the enhanced customer experience that, wanted to be, that you wanted to focus on via this power forward discussion. Um, so the first is uh, some cold storage facilities. Uh, one, uh, Great Lakes Cold Storage, is actually a facility, uh, a company that has um, a facility in Solana, Ohio. Um, when they originally came to us, their primary objective was quote unquote cost savings. They needed relief from energy from their refrigeration and lighting at their facilities. Those w are their biggest operating expenses, the refrigeration and lighting at their facilities. They worked with us on two specific goals, demand response and to address their peak demand charges. Why did they do demand response? Why was that part of what they knew they wanted to do with that? Because they knew they were going to get paid for it. I have been told that demand response is the greatest customer acquisition tool that there could be. You are giving customers checks to not only save money, but to learn more about how to save additional money on, be on top of that. We also have a number of customers, and these customers would be included, who an important element for them participating in demand response is they know that they are helping their community, that they are helping to prevent brownouts and blackouts. And it goes to the sustainability and the reliability planning and the corporate and social responsibility of entities. And so they want to achieve all of that, and they can do it through something that gives them a check. With the Great Lakes uh, storage facility, um, just to give you an example of how the innovation and technology was at work with them, they started with demand response. Um, we worked with them to create their ener energy reduction plan. Through that process um, at their Solon facility, we identified 1.6 megawatts of operationally dispatchable DR. Um, that created 33,000, this is just a one point in year uh, reference, this is obviously dependent upon the clearing prices in PJM, but at the snapshot in time that we took this, it was $33,000 a year in payments. And when we started with them, their monthly bills were at $55,000 a month. Over the course of about a year, we were able to, through the insights that they received in their facilities and their operati operations and in the creation of their reduction plan, they were able to take their bill from $55,000 a month to down to $32,000 a month, all while increasing their total consumption. The insight that they had through our work with them and use of our technology and through our platform identified for them that the times that they were peaking during the day, that they could actually flatten out their load, consume more overall, but still reduce the amount that they were spending on a monthly amount. Again, an enhanced customer experience, a very pleased customer who is looking to replicate that across additional facilities that they have. Um, again, just to, for the benefits that they highlighted for us was savings and costs. It certainly helped them become greener. It allowed them to identify greater efficiencies and savings from flattening their peaks. 
it was their operations were now less taxing on their refrigeration equipment because instead of peaking throughout the day and flattening out the demand and usage of their equipment, they were taxing their equipment less. They were also able to reinvest that $33,000 a, a year that they were getting for operationally dispatchable DR. They first reinvested that in upgraded lighting. They then were then taking the next wave of the money that they were receiving to reinvest that in installing new doors that had been over 25 years old because they recognized the efficiencies of the lost efficiencies of such old doors. So this is an example of demand response at work spurring innovation, technology, reinvestment in our economy. Another example outside of the cold storage area is a another dear, near and dear to my heart, is a chocolate manufacturing plant. Um, in 2011, they instituted a comprehensive energy conservation program. And at the outset, um, they specifically sought to improve productivity as part and parcel to their energy conversation, uh, conservation. They knew that in order to identify where they could reduce and how they could safely and effectively reduce without impacting their production schedules, that they would not only accomplish savings in costs, but they were actually starting off knowing that they could accomplish the type of incidental benefits that I just referenced with the storage facility in terms of the less taxing on their refrigeration equipment. Bomber Chocolates knew off the bat that that was an additional benefit that they sought by participating in this holistic program. But what was their problem be in order to get started? Funding was the biggest logistical hurdle that they had to implement their broader plan of energy conservation. So they started with DR. Within a few years, they have been able to reinvest that, that money that they've received, both in terms of direct payments, as well as identifying adjustments to consumption to reduce and manage their peaks by investing in our energy intelligence software for an integrated energy solution across their facilities. Um, I'll quickly also touch on, on a school district. Uh, we have a school district, North Penn in Pennsylvania. Initially, they started out with an RFP for just demand response. They knew that there was something that they could turn off lights, they could turn off AC, and they could get paid for it and help them with budget purposes. Um, when they received the bids from the different demand response providers, they picked us, and specifically because we highlighted for them that it was not just about demand response. It was what does demand response enable your school to do beyond, both with the insight that you will receive through the platform that we provide that you have to have in order to do demand response, as well as the data that it provided customers uh, provided that school district with a means by which they could actually act upon the data that they were getting from their, from, from their participation in demand response. After their first year in DR, they received seven, over $75,000 for the school district in demand response payments. And again, these are dependent upon the delivery year in which it occurred, so the price points in PJM. So just understand that this is not necessarily this is dependent upon market conditions. But again, the first year, over $75,000 in, in savings or in payments from demand response participation, $795,000 in costs that were avoided because of the additional insight into their operations, and an approximate 38% reduction in their peak. They continue to reinvest that cost savings and those dollars that they receive via checks in their broader energy conservation plans, which is an additional connection for them with their community. So what have we learned from these customers as well as other, or thousands of other customers, both in PJM uh, and around? Um, we've pr conducted both anonymous customer surveys as well as in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And here we have um, a, a list of uh, a lot of, um, I don't know that I would describe them as incidental benefits, but again, it gets back to demand response is not just turning off your lights. There is a broad range of benefits that customers receive from participating in demand response. One thing that's not on the list that I've been focusing on quite a bit here is the check. No doubt that is huge for the operationally dispatchable demand response customer participants, but that is expected. And what you want to talk about is what is enhancing customers' experience. How else is demand response enhancing customers' experience? And this is showing that demand response is a main ingredient in the recipe for the grid for the future. 
What's also not on the list are the other, other non-energy related benefits. Um, money that can be funneled into other budgetary needs. Um, we have one customer, it was a paper plant um, that was located in another part of the country um, who literally told us the money that they received from the demand response program kept their manufacturing facility open during times of financial crisis. That if they didn't have the additional revenues, and again, this is a large customer with a large sophisticated manufacturing facility, but those revenues made or break, make, were a make or break element in whether or not that facility stayed open. Um, so that is a non-energy benefit of their commitment to, to demand response. Um, the first item that's on the list references our energy expertise. Um, I wanted to highlight that because again, that is why I keep highlighting the benefits of CSPs and aggregators bringing customers together and having the customers having the ability to benefit from our investments in technology and innovation and what we learn from consumers. So what does this show for the future? What's the roadmap for the future in Ohio specific to demand response? So the first that I would suggest is going back to the slide where I showed the best flavor of DR, the one most interesting to you, which is the Ohio flavor of DR. Remember, that was only operationally dispatchable PJM DR. You in Ohio have an opportunity to get more customers participating in what I like to refer to as the gateway drug for energy efficiency and uh, cons conservation um, with demand response via that great ac customer acquisition tool with the check in hand. If you look to um, Pennsylvania's Act 129 program, what you will see there, um, and, and uh, as with all programs, um, there are lessons to be learned, both po positive and negative, but I, I strongly encourage a review of the Act 129 program. The statewide evaluator in Pennsylvania has determined the cost effectiveness of that peak shaving program, which is allowing customers to dual enroll for their different types of reduction capabilities, the distinction be which is why the distinction between peak shaving load management versus operationally dispatchable DR. That is a peak shaving program at, in the state at the utility level where customers are still able to be paid for that. So you still get the benefit of the customer engagement via the check and the ability to reinvest. Um, the other, there's two things that I think are important for you. Um, an additional thing I should say that I need to highlight that I had referenced before, but in addition to Having a state DR program similar to, similar to something like the Act 129 that's in Pennsylvania, not only does that put more money in pockets of more Ohio consumers, but by the way, it finds a home for the demand response that had previously qualified as a capacity resource in PJM and that can no longer qualify as a capacity performance if it cannot demonstrate its year-round capability. It is a perfect home. Um, if you go back to the original filing from PJM, they committed to um, taking stakeholder efforts to reviewing better ways to reflect the values of peak shaving programs like Act 129 and things like their forecasting and, <coughs> and in how they complement their operationally dispatchable program. Um, I strongly suggest you encourage those conversations in the PJM stakeholder process to move forward. Obviously, the lack of a quorum at FERC prevents a lot of things from moving forward, um, but those are conversations that I very much look forward to having in PJM. There's also DER out there. So you know us as a demand response provider, but we are expanding into the realm of DER. Um, and that is largely, we are not shifting away from demand response, but largely prompted by customer interests and customer capabilities, we are very thoughtfully and carefully looking how we can expand um, our customers' activity to not just demand response, but to DER resources as well. We, um, we are identifying both motivated customers who are coming to us on their own. We are also, we have built an engine 
This is where our market expertise and our customer knowledge and experience with our customers and what does enhance their electric consumption experience. We are identifying markets where it is optimal right now for customers to invest in DER, to build upon their DER footprint and invest in DER. The return on investment time varies dependent upon the customer specific uh, situation and the market in which it is in. Um, but we're talking without subsidies, um, you're talking about the potential return on investment of just a few years while they're still getting payments for demand response participation. Um, I, I cannot reinforce how important the baseline of the demand response participation is for customers. Um, some common factors that we've identified as to how you can incentivize or you can get the growth of demand. One more minute, Katie. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. I'm going too long. I apologize. Um, some common factors are high demand charges. I know that scares you as a commission, but that is actually a motivating factor. Um, for investment in DER resources, storage mandates, um, and of course, um, previous demand response experience. I've gone through the role of CSPs and why that translates as well, not just into DER, but as well, with, uh, not just with DER, but with DER as well. The last thing that I'm gonna leave with you then is how to incentivize deployment of DER in Ohio. Two ideas that I really would love for you guys to think about as you move forward and power forward. Um, the first is having a solid DR base, um, not just the PJM DR base that you have. Um, the second is ensure that motivated DR investments are not prohibited. Again, I'm talking about non-subsidized um, customers who are motivated in this. Ensure whether it's behind the meter, in front of the meter, injecting, not injecting, make sure that there is flexibility because every customer is different. Some are Genevas, some are not, and much more motivated. You need to make it available to all different types of customers. The final thing that I would suggest, which is something that we are exploring in other jurisdiction, is DER pilots. Small in nature, um, where uh, the utility um, is part of the finan project financing process. In exchange for that, they receive a commitment and from the provider that that is a dispatchable resource for whatever the program is that the utility would like to have control over that resource for. So in exchange for um, the assistance and financing for the DER resource, the utility is reinforced, made more reliable because of access to that DER resource from an operationally dispatchable perspective. Thank you, and I apologize for going long. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what's really fun about this panel is that you all three come from different perspectives completely. Um, I'm interested in um, hearing from, from Richard and from EE. E. So we've talked about this concept of Geneva, Richard, keep Geneva in mind, be the policymaker um, pushing um, a grid mod um, proceeding and and tell us um, to, to advance your company's goals as we develop our grid mod roadmap, um, your thoughts, similar to what Katie did, but your thoughts associated with um, what we should be thinking about. And then EE, e., I, I think Patty would describe, I th or Patty described I think your success as, as or no, it was Paul Demartini, as unstructured versus structured. So it's so, meaning that we, we the, the PUCO has not done anything to assist in your success, but yet your product is being deployed successfully in home. So um, think about that. But Richard, um, thoughts? Sure. First is um, when you conceptualize or when you think about grid modernization, I would encourage you not to think of it purely as an engineering issue, uh, but think of it as modernizing the utility experience and modernizing the, the utility business and modernizing the regulatory structure as well as modernizing the grid itself. So think about grid modernization broadly. Now as you do that, uh, you'll presumably utilities will come to you. I don't know, I don't think you know exactly how this is gonna move forward, but utilities will come to you with proposals for new investments. I think you should make sure that those new investments are paired with an improved customer experience. What we have seen across the country is that uh, in some places, utilities will bring a business case to a commission that's solely based on 
um, technical solutions and engineering issues and th is almost entirely based on the utility achieving some sort of operational cost savings. That leaves customer benefits on the table and customers miss out and it's a huge missed opportunity. So I would encourage you to, uh, to ask the utilities to bring forward customer facing benefits as part of any proposals for new investments. Very good. E -E. Yeah, I think you raised a really good point, Chairman. Uh, you know, customers are purchasing these products right now. They are delighted by these products, but again, you know, there is low penetration in the market. We have tens of thousands of devices out in Ohio right now, but think about how do we get to hundreds of thousands or a million even. You know, that, that takes a lot more education. You know, thermostats is not something that people, again, think about from day to day, you know, where where can we invest from a customer education awareness perspective? What about um, you know electric and gas collaboration? You know, if the electric utilities are talking to one customer, gas utilities are talking to the same customer. If we're talking to the same customer, maybe we should be thinking about you know one message for that customer. Um, you know, some some that you know going back to that simple you know consistent message, I think is really important. Um, and then also you know I think from a you, know, you you look at these products as products, but not uh, uh, have you know we're just starting to tap into and scratch the surface of those software services on top of the product. So these thermostats are really a foundation for what's to come with customer engagement and customer energy programs. And this is really on the residential side, right? Where you know I think it's been really difficult to tap into residential customers, um, get engage those customers to to do more. And I, I think there's this myth that. People think it's too complicated, and you know you don't want to do anything. There's this uh, dichotomy between you know comfort and efficiency, and with you know our products and, and smart thermostats out there, there isn't that that uh, complexity. There isn't that dynamic. You know you can be comfortable and also save, and you can save money too. You know, and and I would say you know as rates um, you know rates go up for residential customers. What kind of enabling technologies can we provide customers to help manage those rates and save even more? And this extends across customer categories. I, I brought up low and mod income. I think that's a huge, um, a huge opportunity for for all of us. Very good. Thank you, um, commissioners. Commissioner Tremble. <laughs> um, I don't have so much of a question as an observation, and. Um, I thought it's very interesting today that we've been able to, I guess, humanize and personalize the, this discussion about grid modernization because it seems like it should be something so techy. But um, I love the fact how, without planning this exactly, Paul D. Martini this morning talked a lot about um, a day in the life. So the customer at home, at the office, and then coming back to home and how modernization of the grid can enhance their experience in their life in some way. And then we moved on to Patty talking about 65% um, of the segments in, in, in the, across the US are engaged somehow by movers and shakers or green champions or saving seekers. And then we moved on to Richard, what you um, elaborated on more was this whole notion of Geneva and how getting out in front of concerns and having that communication more personalized can also enhance that experience. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you because I think that's, it's been such a great um, way of explaining this whole process and things that we're looking at here as a commission. So thank you. Other thoughts, Tom? Um, I just want to mention, or I just want to um, have Katie um, possibly respond to uh, when when we ca talk about, or at least when I think about uh, demand response. I think such a difference between the different categories, um, and that uh, you know we have our, our uh, large uh, energy users that are you know very, very advanced into uh, uh, demand response. And uh, some of the other areas, uh, um, small business, uh, commercial, um, are, um, at least the smaller ones are a lot, seemingly to me, seems to be a lot less. And uh, you gave some really specific um, 
uh, ideas for us. And I wondered if you had any other comments in regards to the different um, categories of uh, users. I, I th and that's where uh, knowing your customer, I think, is so important. Um, there are some very small customers, pizza shops, if you will, dry cleaners, um, that have that just because they have a small amount to reduce doesn't mean that they're not engaged. And so understanding your, your customer and being able to tailor a program, a reduction plan to exactly what they need and being able to serve as the market interface for them and simplify that for them is, is crucial. Conversely, you could end up having a very large consumer of electricity who's not particularly engaged, they just want to get their check every month. And so understanding the distinction between customers and behavior is critical. Just because of size or industry does not necessarily indicate desire or motivation or consistency of those reasons to engage in, in demand response or any type of energy efficiency. We've done a lot of studies with um, particularly in, in corporate America and sustainability um, and giving back to the community is a huge component and that has nothing to do with a check. Um, but without knowing your customer, you don't, you, you don't know the appropriate way to harness and harvest that capability that they have at their facility. We've had events um, where we've had dispatches where it was a couple of days in a row, but it was the system w was taxed. And we were on the phone with customers in the middle of events, and we said, we know that you are at your maximum amount, what you've registered. Is there anything else that you can eke out? And the reason that they did it was not because they were getting an energy payment. That's not a whole lot of money that they're going to get for reducing extra. What they did was they knew that they were contributing to the stability of the grid, and they knew that in the long run they were worse off if there was problems in terms of blackouts than if they were able to reduce a little bit extra for that period of time. So so make no mistake, the, the social responsibility motivation is significant in consumers. But again, you don't know that if you are not engaging directly with and understanding your customers. We work with a lot of both grid, PJM type, ISO RTO programs, as well as utility programs as well. We have programs where we are operating directly with the consumer as Enernoc, and then there are other programs where we are, where we are interacting with the consumer, but on behalf of the utility. Um, and our product and service is white labeled for that utility, so that way then the utility relationship with the customer is preserved, because for whatever the reason is in that situation, that is viewed as the, the most crucial in preserving an enhanced consumer experience. So again, I say all this to you, I don't know if this is directly responsive to the question that you posed, but I think that it's, um, it, it, industries and size are indications, but only one data point in understanding the capability and the flexibility that your customers have. Very good. Thank you. Commissioner Friedman. Yeah. First of all, thank, thank you. Um, as we embark on this glimpse into the future today, uh, we're not really constrained, I guess, by tradition. So, uh, Richard, I found it fascinating that as you were talking about partners, uh, you mentioned utilities. And, E, I find it interesting <coughs> that in your slide on partnerships, you have a couple competitive marketplaces in, in, in your slide, ComEd and ConEd specifically. Uh, but neither of you mentioned uh, competitive retail energy suppliers, and we live in a competitive market on the power side here in Ohio. And Katie, you talked about aggregators and curtailment service providers, but uh, I think only 12% uh, in your pie chart included uh, retail providers. So uh, just by way of, uh, of setting, uh, uh, I guess, the, the, the foundation for my question, do you believe 
in the, in the uh, modernized grid that delivery vehicles for the introduction of new technologies and products and services involve service providers beyond those that we have traditionally considered stakeholders in the process, data providers, information providers, software developers, competitive retail energy suppliers. And if you do perceive those entities to have a viable role in the future, what might the impediments be to evolving that marketplace? It's a really long question, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's a complicated question too, but let me just say a little bit about why we have primarily focused on the regulated utilities. And it's because um, a lot of our history is in demand side management. And in demand side management, what we find is that it works best <coughs> if you have a market where um, the, the same entity is bound by some sort of obligation to deliver efficiency or demand side management, where they have a financial incentive to deliver it, where they have a customer relationship, and where they have access to the data that's needed to deliver the demand side management programs. And those four things are really tough to align for a retailer. They're easier to align for a regulated utility. There are places where they aren't perfectly aligned, and those have been hard markets for utility-run demand-side management, especially internationally. Think of like the UK, where the, the grid owner and the operator that has the data isn't the same person that has the customer relationship, and the financial incentives are all, they aren't perfectly aligned. So that, that's why we have focused prim primarily on the, the regulated utility. We, we do provide services to retailers, so. Yeah, and that, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I, you know, my focus is, is with regulated utilities, and so that's the crux of my presentation today, but N Nest does work with retail electric suppliers as well, um, and we've, we've had a lot of success there. And I think the value prop to retail electric suppliers or Crest providers is, is quite a bit different than to regulated utilities. So with Crest providers, you know, a lot of it is customer acquisition. Um, you know, it's a very different type of, of uh, uh, customer engagement. And you know, our focus on the regulated side, I think there's tremendous potential that doesn't automatically, you know, isn't automatically acknowledged as a natural fit, necessarily. Um, you know, with, with a lot of these legacy, traditional legacy programs um, in the regulated world, it's really hard to shift away from that. You know, innovation isn't easy. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, there is uh, even more em emphasis on our part to see how we can partner as a technology provider. How can we partner with the, these regulated industries to really further the demand side management? We, we see ourselves almost as a, a spork of <laughs> demand side management. You've got energy efficiency, you've got demand response, you've got, you know, everything in one vehicle where traditionally you haven't had um, a, a product or a device that can do more than one thing. And so I think that's why, you know, there is this renewed focus and emphasis on regulated partnerships. But we do, we work with cross re retail electric suppliers, insurance companies, telcos, security partners, et cetera. So, you know, we, we're we're excited to partner wherever it makes sense for the customer, and I think key is just meeting customers where they are. Uh, you know, they're going to find out about products, smart products, connected products through various means, and and we want to make sure to uh, make it as easy as possible. Very good, Commissioner. Uh, thank thank you. I, I really appreciated each of your presentations. Very very helpful and and, and interesting. I, I did want to concentrate just for a moment on the on the, the, the portion that EE e. and to a lesser extent Richard uh, um, uh, addressed, I think, which is um, you know, the, the benefits that uh, might be available through the widespread um, facilitation of um, smart meter deployment. Um, uh, the more smart meters you have throughout a broader section of the consumer population, the more potential there is for widespread benefits from a modern grid. Um, so, EE e. or Richard, what are the, do you think are the, um, the places, the segment, the customer segments where deployment of smart meters is, is, uh, is successful and, and is happening, and then conversely, w which segments maybe are uh, places where it's not uh, progressing as well, and what are the, what can, what can be done on a, I guess it would be an un on a structured basis for um, facilitating better penetration in the areas, particularly where 
uh, acceptance isn't as ready, readily uh, achieved. Okay. Um, so everybody should get a smart meter. Uh, I'm speaking about the residential sector here. Uh, when everybody has a smart meter, you're allowed to, or you're, you're able to deliver a wide range of new programs. Let me give a, just a few examples. First is, if everybody has a smart meter, then it's easy to measure uh, by setting up what we call randomized control trials. Uh, so you've got a control group and a treatment group. It's easy to measure how usage changes, not just over a month or over a year, but over an hour. And so you're able to run demands and response programs in the residential sector, and specifically uh, r behavioral demand response programs that don't have any installed devices in the home. Now you're also able to deliver a range of new insights for customers. So instead of telling them uh, your house looks old, so maybe you should insulate it, now you would know if you have a smart meter, you were using a lot of uh, energy at a certain time, and maybe you're even able to figure out based on your load profile, this appliance is using a lot of energy, and you're able to deliver a very targeted insight to that customer. And finally, it would help you with, um, with segmenting customers across behavioral lines. So you would know if somebody is an afternoon user or is a nighttime user. If they're a big nighttime user, you don't want to send them information about reducing their morning consumption, for example. So you're able to give them much more targeted information based on when they use energy. Is that, but I want to be sure that's actually answering your question. Well, it answers the second question. The first question is, um, where, are we, where do we find ourselves with resistance to the, the initial deployment of, this, of the smart meters, and what can be done uh, if it doesn't happen on an unstructured avalanche basis, if that isn't how the, av the, the deployment occurs across all segments, but rather if there are pockets or, or segments where deployment is not occurring as readily, what can be done, whether we can do it or whether Nest can do it or whether the utilities can do it, what can be done to facilitate the widespread deployment of thermostats? Um, so is it rebates? Is it, uh, is it combining, yeah. you know, combining gas and electric programs? Is it education? Sorry, and I, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. I may have misheard you at first. I was speaking about smart meters. Um, smart thermostats, I think, are a different question that certainly EE should address. Okay. Yeah, and I think um, sometimes, you know, smart meters and, and smart devices I are... I misspoke, but I meant to mm -hmm. pose the question, smart thermostats. Okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, that's sorry. a great question, and I think that you know, with the smart meter rollout, a lot of times you conflate the two to be the same, and I, I think that you know, smart smart meters, um, you know, may not actually provide customers with a whole lot of benefits initially, right? Uh, you know, they they get a smart meter, and then and then what? Um, and from a smart thermostat perspective, you know, we. Oh, there, there's a lot of opportunities for engagement. I think the, the, the piece that, um, you know, smart thermostats, so we, we have runtime of heating and cooling. That's, that's all the consumption that we have, right? We don't know what else is going on in the homes. Um, now, with respect to smart thermostats and, and spraying adoption, I do think um, rebates are absolutely one of the, the best indicators. As you saw on that slide, there's that, that big map of um, nationwide rebates. And, you know, we're seeing about that hundred dollar really being that tipping point for for customers uh, to, to really get over the the hump here and as patty had mentioned you know i think price is a huge huge part of um, a barrier another is you know insulation i think people are you know something that you don't really think about of doing yourself and we have kind of two initiatives we have this do-it-yourself initiative where we're trying to make it as easy as possible then we also have a do-it-for-me initiative where you know some people are just, they're not gonna wanna do it. They, they'd rather have somebody else, some, a professional come in. And so we, we have a, a big contractor network. And so you know working with utility companies and their contractor networks and, and really getting the word out there. So the education piece I think is absolutely critical paired with um, you know, a rebate or incentive. And, and really it's all about reducing friction from a, for the customer. And even thinking about the rebate uh, process, you know, this, this concept of 
uh, filling out a paper form and putting all of this information you know in there and even you know finding an account number for example you know things that people don't really have handy is there a way to really rethink how we do rebates is there a really way to bring kind of those incentives closer to the to, to the point of purchase or to the customer I think there's a lot to um, to to really dig in there on, and I think Illinois is a really great example of um, strategies to, to figure out, you know, is there a, a online marketplace where customers can get these incentives um, instantaneously, but with validation, obviously, because, you know, you need to make sure that you know, there, there isn't any fraud or leakage. Uh, I think there's a lot of really exciting initiatives happening in Illinois, and I think, you know, I'm happy to, to you know, talk with you guys further about you know what what they're doing out there. Yeah, it yields it yields an important sort of policy consideration that we're going to have to make. I mean, I think all three of you are situated differently in the market space. You're you're sp selling a very specific product, Absolutely. and so would the commission um, collectively move? To better the situation for Nest to sell your product, I mean, it's some. So, so I, I think your question yields a kind of an interesting um, sort of policy discussion. I mean, I think part of what we're we're trying to do here um, is understand um, if we're we're thinking of the walk, jog, run. Um, what it takes to potentially create the modernized grid, and then from there wonder if it's. Um, if, as far as products are concerned, if it's us that should be trying to, um, and that's why I asked the education question yeah. to um, Patty Durant, if it's us that should be trying to educate customers about the possibilities once everyone does have a smart meter, um, or um, us that should be um, uh, through um, decision making, trying to advance um, um, products, which is which is an interesting mm -hmm. policy discussion um, for us to have here eventually. I just just to be clear, I was uh, first of all, I apologize if I if I use the word meter in my questions because I meant to focus on the thermostat. And I also wasn't focusing on any particular brand of thermostat, but it yeah. just sounded to me from listening to the presentations that. There could potentially be a lot of benefits from the widespread deployment of smart thermostats, and what are the barriers to ha getting that getting that accomplished, and and who's best positioned to yeah, it's reduce it the barriers. Agreed, it's interesting, and I think Katie, you described um, you described DR as a gateway um, as well. So um, what I, th I think it I think it yields a really kind of interesting discussion. If you te you've all teed it up for us nicely, I think we have one more question from um, Mahila. Go ahead, please. This is a question for Katie. Katie, uh, what might you say uh, are the common barriers uh, to the aggregation of DERS uh, to participate in the wholesale market? Common barriers to entry for distributed energy yeah. resources at the wholesale or retail level? Well, to aggregate the DERS to participate. Specifically for the aggregation? Yes. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I don't know that we have enough experience at this point in time to give you um, a direct answer on that. Um, we are very much in the learning stage um, from our customers right now in terms of what they want, what they are capable of, what they are interested in. So we are trying not to put the cart before the horse in terms of going out and aggregating a whole bunch of DER customers um, until we see what there is to aggregate. I think with demand response, it was, um, it was a little bit clearer um, at the outset in terms of the, the benefits of aggregation and what needed to be done to overcome um, the barriers that were in place for aggregation specific to DR, but there are so many, I talked about the flavors of DR, there are so many flavors of DER. Um, are you injecting, are you not injecting, are you behind the meter, are you front of the meter? Um, and so I, I don't know that I have a specific answer. It's interesting, as we were preparing for the uh, the NOPER that's out at FERC right I was now. say, this is the subject of the That FERC is exactly NOPER, right? it. And, yeah. I, and I had a conversation with Craig Glazer um, one day as everybody was preparing. Big mistake. No <laughs> I'm kidding. Craig's a friend of I the know, Ohio Commission. Ohio. Craig's <laughs> watching at home. Hi, Craig. Well, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Craig. Yeah. 
but he posed a very good question to me because we, what we talk, what we focused on in those comments a lot was, you have a model out there in terms of DR aggregators. Learn from that um, in terms of replicating and what could be a good model for aggregators for DER resources separate and apart from DR. And Craig kept saying to me, he's like, well, that's wonderful, but your customers are going to want to do DER. So what do you want? What is the business? What is the market structure? What do you want in order to, to grow that DER business? I said, Craig, I don't know the answer to that question for you right now. I said, I, I have not learned enough from my customers and there is too much diversity in order to come up with a common set of principles right now. And he paused for a second and he goes, I appreciate that. I think he. I, I think that there are so many people that are at you guys saying, do this, do this to make it better for my business model and we're just not necessarily at that point just yet because we don't see a whole slew of customers at that point yet. They need to be engaged, they need to be intrigued um, and be shown the business case for it. But I would say that there is enough fertile ground that we are pursuing without having to ask for any changes at the present moment. Folk, other companies will have a very big disagreement with that. I, I know that that go to the PGM stakeholder process and they'll say something very different. Um, so, Katie, related to that, then the pilot projects would be just to make sense of uh, how, you know, how to leverage the DER resources better or just to make sense of what we want, really? Yes, and, and we've spoken, and these have been one-on-one -on -one conversations with some utilities across the country who see the benefits they want to do before they're told to something to do in terms of advancing their distribution systems to have more distributed energy resources, but they see the value of it um, being installed at the customer level. And so there have been very interesting conversations. I'm not talking major pilots, I'm talking 15, maybe 15 to 20 megawatts worth. Um, but, but yes, where it is, it, financing is a big issue. It is a big hurdle that needs to be overcome even with the most motivated customers. And, um, and, and, and a utility is a, can serve as a key component, and they've got the relationship there. Um, something that I didn't point out before, but one of the, we, we did a survey of customers who were specifically in utility bilateral demand response programs. Um, and uh, honestly, the vast majority of them said that demand response didn't positively or negatively influence their opinion of their utility. But every time that demand response did impact their opinion of the utility, it was for the better. So there was no situation where demand response had hurt the impression of the utility. Um, and to me, that's, you know, this it's pilot programs at the utility level for some specific customers that fit certain criteria, um, I think, um, is a way to, to stimulate it and to preserve that very important relationship between the utility and their consumers. Okay, last word right there. Thank you very much. Um, so this phase is entitled A Glimpse of the Future. And so I think all three of these panelists, um, while representing, of course, different entities and advancing um, different opportunities, um, expressed to us today what um, the benefits could be um, in the grid mod world. So thank you very much. Very much appreciate your time. Um, round of applause, please.